Dear participants of today's session, I wish you good morning and welcome you to this webinar devoted to biodiversity and nature protection in Bosnia and Herzegovina. Thank you very much for joining us uh, in such a huge number in circumstances uh, caused by the pandemic. It is extremely nice to see such a huge number of participants in our webinar. In some other circumstances, we could not uh, host such a huge number. My name is Senka Barudanovic. I am professor at the Faculty of Mathematics and Science of the University of Sarajevo. I am the head of ecology section at the biology department. Today, uh, together with my colleague, Professor Milan Mataruga, who is also a professor at the University in Banja Luka at the forestry faculty, I will moderate this session. The session is uh, aims to strengthen our capacity to raise the awareness uh, of required planned actions for nature protection in the next 10 years. This webinar, as you may know, is a part uh, of the ESAP project activities, uh, ESAP 2000. 30 development of the strategy and action plan for environment in Bosnia and Herzegovina until 2030. Within this webinar, we will have an opportunity to hear three distinguished experts in development of ecological networks in Europe. They will share with us their knowledge and experience in this process. They will address the benefits of the establishment of ecological networks, uh, both for biodiversity and nature, as well as humans and the society as such. In Bosnia and Herzegovina, traditionally, we are fond of our nature. We are very proud of our nature. And it is the fact that uh, we have very often taken it as granted for granted. And I do hope that the take out from this webinar make us richer and uh, we will gain some ideas and the clarity as to how we can continue protecting our nature using European mechanism, mechanisms which proved to be ex successful and efficient in the biodiversity conservation. In order to achieve our goal today, of course, we need to use the capacities, fully use the capacities of this webinar, and we will try to do so. To this end, may I throw your attention to the fact that although you cannot uh, speak directly with us, I kindly ask you to use the question and answer box for asking any questions. You have an icon Q&A where you can ask questions and your questions will be read out and translated to our panelists and uh, one of them will be answering your question. In addition to this, in order to work smoothly on this uh, webinar. I could, I would kindly ask all the native speaker of Bosnian, Serbian or Croatian to use this option in the interpretation action and English speakers, of course, to use the English option. Let me also remind you that we will have a 10 minute break 
at 10.25, and we will try to stick to the agenda and the timeline as much as possible. I will now hand over to Professor Milan Mataruga, PhD. Professor, the floor is yours. Thank you, Professor. Certainly, I will use this opportunity to welcome our distinguished uh, lecturers and uh, presenters. And uh, I also would like to say that uh, I'm extremely pleased that we have uh, such a huge response and so many participants, the highest number so far at our webinars. I will try to share my presentation at the beginning. Uh, my, my colleague Barudanovic and myself prepared this presentation in order to provide you with an overview of uh, biodiversity situation especially uh, or focusing on uh, the establishment of uh, the Natura 2000 network in Bosnia and Herzegovina. I hope you can hear me well and you can see my presentation. As uh, Professor Sink already noted, for those who, uh, who attend these activities of uh, ESOP development for the first time, I should note that uh, this webinar is uh, taking place uh, within the activities developed by uh, of strategy and action plan development uh, funded by the Swedish Embassy and implemented by the Stockholm Environment Institute. The aim of this process is uh, to provide and uh, finish the strategy and uh, submit it to the governments across the level, BIH, uh, Federation, the Publica Subska and Pachko District for their adoption. The project is taking place within seven working groups. And as you may see, we are in the working group number three, biology, biodiversity and uh, nature conservation. Thanks to these activities uh, and the project, uh, we will have a number of workshops and the webinars, and this is the third one. If uh, you are interested uh, and eager to learn about some other topics, uh, you can continue attending our webinars. Briefly, as Professor Barudanovic noted, uh, we uh, tend to brag about our nature and biodiversity in Bosnia and Herzegovina. And uh, I will not take too much time talking about over 5,000 species that uh, had been identified uh, in the territory of Bosnia and Herzegovina and nearly 1,800 endemic species. But that's thanks to the fact that Bosnia and Herzegovina through bio geographical regions uh, identified by Natura 2000 is positioned in three regions, continental, alpic, and Mediterranean. In our previous activities uh, uh, in the implementation of ESAP uh, within the Working Group for Biodiversity, regardless of the jurisdiction or the, the level of the governments, we identified nine groups of challenges, someone would say problems, but we call them challenges, which should be addressed uh, in a near future in order to have a better approach to nature conservation in compliance with the EU principles. First of all, we identified legislative uh, challenges. Uh, we identify the non-compliant uh, regulations and the laws which are not aligned uh, with the EU legislation and regulations, then we identified institutional challenges. And uh, what we should uh, stress today, we don't have sufficient exact uh, accurate data on biodiversity in Bosnia and Herzegovina. The level of protection of nature has been increasing on a daily basis, but we have not achieved EU standards yet. We should also reflect, uh, address the lack of political will, uh, undeveloped uh, public awareness, 
uh, the very uh, that politicians tend to take decisions uh, without uh, previously consulting uh, scientists and scientific science and uh, a prevailing problem is the lack of funds for all these activities given the fact that natura 2000 is an activity which comprises uh, two major directives directive on birds and directive on habitats uh, i should uh, inform you what has been done in bosnia and herzegovina to this end we started uh, 10 years ago and uh, we established preliminary emerald uh, uh, network and then in the period 2007 2015 we implemented four projects uh, in all these project uh, stages uh, we were developing reference lists and we have tried to amend uh, the applicable legislation and regulations so as to enable full implementation of Natura 2000 in Bosnia and Herzegovina. And at the end of this project period, as you may see, we adopted the reference list and uh, we already prepared some preliminary plans, uh, management plans for pilot areas. Uh, we also developed some uh, manuals, but uh, uh, we uh, actually stopped uh, when we had uh, started to develop IT system, which should have been established because in Bosnia and Herzegovina, we could not agree where we would should uh, set up this system. And at the end, the system was set up in Croatia and it was active uh, when while we had uh, the connection, but uh, uh, in the meantime, it was uh, closed down, so we don't have access to this. Um, the similar happened to the communication strategy. We should have formed uh, the website Natura 2000, which is not active and which is not access uh, accessible. As a result of these activities until 2015, we prepared preliminary lists of uh, areas, 122 areas. Uh, we proposed uh, nearly 1 million hectares of, uh, uh, for the Natura network to be included in the Natura uh, network, and over 2 100 species were identified under annexes one, two, and four, directive uh, on habitats. And uh, all this has been done based on available literature and references uh, the researchers could obtain in Bosnia and Herzegovina. We did not have sufficient uh, field research. In, uh, we had insufficient uh, financial support in order to start uh, to engage on mapping of areas and uh, data collection in the field. Unfortunately, from 2015 until 2021, the processes on the implementation of Natura 2000 nearly stopped in Bosnia and Herzegovina. And this is uh, something which we sh may perhaps uh, stress as one of the major goals of our activities. We should uh, seek to identify mechanisms to secure financial and political uh, support and agreement among uh, various uh, jurisdictions in Bosnia and Herzegovina, taking into account different responsibilities across the jurisdiction and in compliance uh, with the constitution of Bosnia and Herzegovina. Uh, and uh, that, that would enable us to continue our work. We are fully aware of the procedures. Uh, and uh, at this point, uh, what we are missing is uh, mapping uh, of uh, different areas. Uh, we need to fill uh, the forms uh, and uh, uh, define uh, specific areas. And of course, we need to take activities which will uh, uh, 
uh, lead uh, the participation of Bosnia and Herzegovina at biogeographical seminars. So we are able to present what has been done in Bosnia and Herzegovina. This is uh, just a very short overview of what we have done and what we expect in the near future. I believe uh, you will have uh, much more questions for our distinguished uh, panelists uh, from other countries. Professor Senka Barudanovic and myself, not only during this webinar, but uh, any time thereafter, will remain available for any questions you may have, any comments, and uh, you are mostly welcome to get involved in the activities of our working groups. We need this uh, to come up with documents uh, which will enhance uh, all the procedures that are ongoing and improve the standards in this area. Professor Barudanovic, thank you. Uh, I turn over to you. Thank you, Professor Mataruga, for this very brief and concise overview of uh, the challenges uh, we face uh, uh, in efforts to establish Net Natura Network and uh, other networks. Uh, and thank you very much for inviting the public to join us uh, uh, to in, in our efforts to define the policies, area policies. Now I will invite our first panelist, Mr. Kaya Peterson, who will present a case study from Estonia. Of course, uh, we will see what we can apply from what she informs us uh, in our country. Allow me to briefly introduce the panelist, Kaya Peterson. Uh, is working in SEI Institute uh, office in Tallinn since 1993. She is a senior researcher and uh, since uh, 2000 is director of the Sustainable Development Program. Her fields of interest and research include environmental policy, specifically environmental assessment, issues such as the methods of impact assessment, environmental management, the process of public involvement, and the consideration of results of public involvement in decision making. Kaya published several books, guidelines, and papers on these issues, and she is an, also a respected and distinguished lecturer on these topics. Kaya, you have the floor. Uh, thank, thank you, Senka, for this uh, very, very nice and promising introduction. Uh, what I would, uh, I would add is probably that the participants are uh, wondering uh, what is my relationship with uh, with nature conservation and, and Natura 2000. Yeah, then I can assure you that I was uh, the project manager for selecting uh, the bird areas, uh, the SBAs uh, under the birds directive for Estonia uh, between 2000 and, and 2003 when Estonia was very heavily involved in joining the EU because uh, Estonia joined EU in 2004. And so it took us a little bit less than nine years from the association agreement with the EU to become a full member of the EU and, and do all the different environmental key activities and transposition of EU legislation in, in less than uh, nine years. So we regard it quite a strenuous period for us. But it also provided uh, Estonia a lot of new experiences and new, I would say, new values. And, uh, and even in the nature conservation field, because my first training comes from ecology, and uh, then I have built up on environmental assessment and specifically the Natura assessment or appropriate assessment. So uh, this is what I would like to share with you, the Estonian experience today, uh, what we learned, and uh, especially from the perspective of an ecologist. So this is, this is my background. Could I have the first slides, please? The next one, please. 
Yeah, so I would like to touch upon what are the differences or what have been the main differences uh, applying the, the EU nature conservation directives, the habitats directive and the birds directive. Because uh, as any other country and also uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina uh, and, and uh, all the European countries have a long history of nature conservation. And uh, what is uh, Natura 2000 brings along? What are the differences? What we should reconsider uh, what, and maybe even reevaluate? And uh, definitely the transposition and implementation of the two nature conservation directives of EU bring along uh, different impacts, uh, different effects to not only to nature conservation, but also to other sectors because they are all interlinked. And uh, finally, just uh, to visualize uh, some of the Estonian examples. Next slide, please. What I consider the, the main difference is uh, that um, nature conservation has become more uh, of, a, of a legal procedure. Uh, on one hand, it has become rather complicated as, as any legal procedure usually does. But on the other hand, it has given nature conservation a very firm legal framework which means that you can't just do anything in the nature, but you have to consider, you have to justify, you have to moti um, motivate your decisions. And more importantly, you have to plan and assess uh, the activities with the consideration of what would be the impacts on, on the nature. So the... Nature conservation is uh, populated quite a lot of different terms, but they are not just simple terms. They have legal framework. They are legal. They have legal meaning, and uh, this this makes it uh, probably, as I said, uh, complicated. But when you get used to it, you take it rather naturally. What it also brought about, uh, at least to Estonia, was that uh, uh, accidentally or, or <laughs> by surprise to some people or decision makers at local and, and the governmental level, that the ecologists have become very important positions, very, very important people, because they know the species, they know the habitats, they know how they function, what they need for their functioning. And since this forms the baseline for establishing the Natura 2000 sites, so the, the government officials and the local governments are, are desperately looking for, for this information. And who are the people who know the beetles, who know the, the different plant species or lichens or mosses? Or, or uh, even snails, uh, whatever uh, are listed uh, in, the, in the habitats uh, directive annexes, and also the birds, uh, similar, similar to the habitat directive. So the ecologists are becoming very important people and, uh, and with the backing of the legal system and with the backing of uh, decision-making and, and impact assessment. Thirdly, I would point out that uh, quite a lot of time and um, resources and thinking were initially, at least in my country, devoted to demarcation, bordering the, the areas. And, uh, and when the impact assessments were organized, then the borders were, were taken as very important uh, uh, aspects of uh, where the impact actually reaches, what is uh, in, the, in the impact area, whether there are any uh, Natura 2000 sites. But I would like to assure you, and I will visualize it also in the next, uh, in, in the next slide, that the borders actually do not matter so much. It's, uh, it's about uh, land ownership and, and how to uh, how to um, identify the areas 
But in terms of the impacts, the borders does, do not uh, matter so much at all. So the impact, whether uh, the impact, the habitats and species will get the impact or not. And uh, fourthly, I would point out that uh, why I'm saying that nature conservation becomes on very strong uh, legal ground is that uh, every time uh, anything is, uh, is planned in uh, nature, uh, in the outer environment, uh, the Natura assessment or appropriate assessment uh, should be conducted. And uh, more importantly, the, the outcome of this assessment should assure the decision maker whether any impacts are envisaged or no impacts uh, could follow. So if there is an even a slight uncertainty, then, then uh, the Habitats Directive Article 6.3 uh, requests that further uh, and more in-depth assessment is needed, which means that the permissions uh, to build or or excavate or do forest felling or whatever uh, uh, land use change uh, in, in the environment uh, do not have just very simple solutions, but, but rather uh, it should um, uh, become as an as a object of, uh, of uh, impact assessment on the habitats and species. The next slide, please. So as I said, uh, uh, the, the nature conservation becomes as a, as a firm, firm uh, legal grounds and the ecological knowledge uh, is, is very important. And uh, also the, uh, it, it might be looked at its restrictions, restrictions and and uh, the economic activities are prohibited. Uh, this is not the case. Uh, I, will, I will come back to it later today in my second presentation. Uh, what is important is the integrated uh, approach. As I said, the different sectors, uh, not only a sector of view, but also from the point of view of taxing. Uh, let's say there are mechanisms or instruments where the government can provide different taxing systems depending on the, the severity of the limitations to economic activities. But on the other hand, uh, also the compensation measures or, or payments uh, uh, are those that would mitigate uh, those uh, different uh, restrictions. And uh, these become very sophisticated and as far as EU is concerned, uh, quite largely used but we will look at them later today. And uh, lastly, but not leastly, I would say that uh, the nature conservation is, is not your, only your state or entity matter, it's an EU matter. So in, in several cases, the, the approval of the European Commission is needed in order to proceed with, uh, with uh, different activities. So uh, it should also take uh, to be taken into account. The next slide, please. So this is an illustration of what I said about the, the, the borders. Uh, there can be different uh, activities with different impacts. So let's say this uh, green dot is an at Natura 2000 site and, uh, and either this uh, um, is it a corridor or is it uh, uh, something that is going to build uh, a building? Uh, so it may have, the, depending on the, on, the, on the environment, the landscape, the hydrological situation, it may have uh, different uh, impact areas. So uh, the most important thing is whether the Natura site, the habitats and species will be impacted. Not that, let's say, it's 500 meters from the Natura site border, so we, we assume that there are, there are no impacts. Uh, 
So this, uh, those metering doesn't uh, play, a, play a role. Next one, please. This is an illustration of, uh, of how the uh, establishment of Natura 2000 sites uh, was envisaged. And uh, this is probably all known to you. What I want to emphasize in this graph and why uh, the system is called uh, Natura 2000, uh, since uh, the Habitus Directive was adopted in 1992, and it was envisaged that by 2000, everything is in place. Uh, the network is there, it's functioning, the species and habitats are protected. And, uh, and of course, uh, uh, it, it didn't materialize uh, in, in such a well way. Uh, also, depending on the system that, according to the Habitus Directive, the orange boxes here, uh, it's, it's a gradual and a step-by-step -step, uh, uh, assessment of uh, the proposed sites, uh, which be finally become uh, the sites of the Natura 2000 network. Uh, but as you see from the left-hand side, uh, the Birds Directive, is quite simple. Uh, so the, the areas uh, or special areas, uh, the special protection areas, SPAs, if they are identified, they almost immediately become uh, part of the Natura 2000 network. There is one more term in this graph, is the biogeographical seminars, and it was also referred by, by Senka and, uh, and Milan, uh, this is where the experts gather, and they are looking at the um, uh, proposed sites from a biogeographical point of view. Next slide, please. And uh, there are 11 biogeographical regions across Europe, and uh, these regions play quite a, quite a substantial and important role because uh, the addition uh, to the ge biogeographical region from uh, the joining uh, EU countries uh, will be specifically looked at whether it will uh, provide some extra um, uh, sites, uh, extra protected, extra protection to the species. The next one, please. And moreover, uh, from this uh, slide, you can see that uh, some of the habitats uh, uh, are not represented in, in all uh, EU countries, or they are represented to a certain extent. And some countries have uh, quite a, a significant, important role uh, for protecting those uh, habitats and species. The next one, please. For instance, uh, Estonia, Finland, and, uh, and Sweden we have uh, a quite a, quite a important responsibility for alvars, uh, for, for the dry grasslands. And, uh, and these are priority habitats across the EU. So uh, it shows that what, er, what, what happens in Estonia, Finland and Sweden, uh, and uh, especially when the impacts are concerned, then we have to be very careful. It's not only about our country, but it's about the, the habitat across EU. Next one. And this is how the Estonian Natura 2000 network looks like uh, today. I must say that uh, the SBAs, the number of SBAs, 66, and, and even the borders or the area of the SBAs haven't changed since 2004. So we pretty well knew at that time where the best bird areas were, and especially thanks to the projects, different projects prior to the joining of EU, and especially when Stone and Ornithological Society identified the IBAs, the important bird areas. The number of uh, habitat sites uh, has increased to 541. And you, and you see that uh, the marine areas and the, and the mainland with those uh, uh, brownish uh, dots uh, and, uh, and many of the areas uh, of habitats 
are also coinciding with the SBAs, with the bird areas. So it's, it's a good mixture of, um, of uh, applying the nature conservation um, directives in Estonia. But my fellow speakers will now elaborate how they implemented the Natura 2000 in uh, Croatia and, uh, and across EU. So thank you for your attention. Thank you, Kaya, for your informative, resourceful presentation on establishment of Natura 2000 network in Estonia. And indeed, for all the notes which can lead us into thinking as to how to seriously deal with the establishment of the same network in Bosnia and Herzegovina, I will have to note here. Uh, those uh, listeners and audience who have asked questions already in our agenda. We have a special section uh, after 11 o'clock for questions and answers. So you don't expect your answers now, but I would like to prompt you to do use this section and ask your questions. Uh, now we will move uh, uh, to embrace another presentation uh, related to the establishment of Natura 2000 sites and an ecological network in Croatia. It is our great pleasure uh, to greet Drinka Mesic, who is a biologist and ecologist with over 18 years of professional uh, experience in nature conservation, team leader and coordinator of field research on habitat mapping for multiple protected areas and ecological network sites including research of specific objectives of ecological network preservation. Among other things, uh, she worked as coordinator of field research on distribution of 11 taxonomic groups in Republic of Croatia within the EU integration project Natura 2000. And as expert for the ecological network Natura 2000 on a technical assistance program for the implementation of Natura 2000 in Turkey, she participated in the development of the manual for ecological network appropriate assessment Natura 2000 and she has been a lead expert in appropriate assessment of more than 20 projects for the ecological network. During, I apologize, over the last two years she has been a lecturer at the Hunting and Nature Conservation Studies at the Associate Degree College in Karlovac, where she teaches courses on nature conservation and biodiversity. I apologize if I shortened presentation about Zrinka. Now we will have a great pleasure to hear from her on the establishment of establishment of Natura 2000 in Croatia. Uh, Zrinka, please take the floor. Good afternoon. I would like to greet everyone. I'll try to use these 20 minutes to share a process with you, which has lasted for the last 20 years. There are two roles of mine in the process. One as an authorized person working on assessment, uh, appropriate assessment, and the other is a researcher for uh, habitats and uh, species. When we refer to Natura 2000 in Croatia, we, I would like to mention one thing. You can see where this network, when we refer to terrestrial Natura 2000 area, the first three countries, uh, with the highest share of ecological network in their territory are three Baltic countries. Croatia is someone be, somewhat behind Slovenia. At one point, we were in front of them. However, Slovenia later received requirement to include some other areas of its country in Natura 2000. The right-hand side is related to the Tura 2000 area, marine area. And this segment is not showing the percentage, but the share of the area. 
and this is another part which we should add in the next period. Overall, we have uh, slightly less than 37% uh, of the terrestrial territory of the ecological network and uh, slightly above 16% of uh, uh, coastal areas, 745 uh, areas for uh, preservation co uh, of, uh, of, uh, of uh, important areas uh, and uh, some for birds. I should, uh, uh, I was uh, to address the establishment uh, and uh, appropriate assessment of uh, ecological network uh, and uh, management of the ecological network and uh, the part that pertains to every member state that uh, uh, they have to set up a monitoring system to show that uh, they adequately manage the network. The timeline uh, with regard to defining and setting up the ecological network uh, came up uh, uh, back uh, when uh, we discussed the Emerald Network uh, and uh, all the countries had a similar process uh, as you do in Bosnia and Herzegovina. You gather all data regarding the spe species, uh, habitats, uh, uh, you uh, carry out the mapping uh, for this data to uh, integrate them into GIS uh, system. And in this first period uh, from 2002-2005, we pre prepared the proposal for the Emerald Network, which was the basis for us to define first the national ecological network of the Republic of Croatia. And in 2013, when we became a member, it became the Natura 2000 network. I singled out certain other periods and points uh, during this period of 13 years. And one of them is that we established a professional body, the National Institute, one independent national body. This is crucial and uh, this uh, contributes to a quality of, of preparation of the ecological network and its development. There are several other projects which uh, were also directly related to this, uh, including the LIFE project that addressed the challenge of development of the ecological network, uh, which uh, so-called CRONET, Cro which was the basis for further development in 2007 and establishment of, of the ecolo ecological network. Another activity which helped hugely in the preparation process was uh, the development of the map for the Republic of Croatia. If you have such a map, it is easier to define other things, uh, important areas for ecological network, etc. In So we had a number of projects uh, that that were implemented and some processes uh, focusing on the de defining and development of the network through different projects mainly funded by the EU. And in this process, we actually prepared the ecological network in 2013, we simply declared it. When we became the member, uh, we uh, the process did not stop we uh, had to propose our ecological network and it had to be discussed at the biogeographical seminars and that happened very soon for Croatia and the majority of the proposed areas were accepted but uh, for some areas we had to make some modifications. We had to further protect some areas and uh, we had to add some species in other areas. The establishment of the Emerald Network, it is a process 
which uh, requires a mapping of territorial habitats, uh, which is used for development of Natura habitats. Uh, 50 percent of the terrestrial territory of Croatia was actually important for the establishment of this network. In some later analysis, uh, we came up uh, with 37 percent, and that's more or less uh, the percentage uh, which remained unchanged. At the early beginning, uh, the National Institute for Nature Conservation set up uh, a system for information sharing. So information was available and accessible to the public and for all of us who were not directly engaged or employed uh, with the uh, state institutions, it was very useful and uh, enabled us uh, to get engaged in the process. When proposing Natura 2000 areas, every country can add their own species to the list. And Croatia did so in its own proposal. We added, uh, I believe, some 20 species and two habitat types one of them were the sediment barriers uh, eu is uh, sometimes hesitant to accept adding of new species because that can affect other member states if uh, they also have this, uh, these uh, species, then they have to review their areas of ecological species. Uh, when you have uh, the Genia velebitica, which can be found only on the mountain Velebit, it is um, much easier to do this. Now you can see the overview by species, uh, we have 76 uh, habitat types, which were declared a part of the ecological network and 122 bird species and 146 other species. a very important part in the implementation of the whole process, not only the establishment, but uh, some other things that need to be done is the management of, uh, such as management of the ecological network is the information system. The Croatia or the state institute or national institute uh, for nature conservation was responsible for this and it looks uh, like this today this is public information and they are available at request but uh, we are still have no functionality which enables you to obtain data on certain species of plants or animals. But then we have the map of uh, habitats, which is uh, available to everyone. And this uh, makes uh, easier the implementation of the ecological network. On the right hand side, you see the database which was uh, developed by Professor Tony Nikolic from the Math Faculty of Mathematics and Science in Zagreb. This is the database, uh, Flora Croatica database. 
it is a database uh, which uh, was established in late 90s already and today it is a very important source of information both from natura 2000 and uh, nature conservation in general this is really something valuable because all of us uh, who research flora and uh, fauna can contribute to the database and improve it on a daily basis despite the fact that we had multiple projects uh, in this period of 20 years this is a print screen of the description of one area of ecological network uh, you can see the goals of uh, conservation and uh, uh, we marked uh, red data quality dd means data deficiency and uh, this is something which we still lack and there is there are a lot of things that need to be upgraded in this uh, ecological database so the process takes more than 20 years and uh, you must use different mechanisms and uh, projects another important method is that uh, we had uh, a number of projects after we became the member and uh, these projects uh, were seeking to improve uh, this uh, lacking data and uh, i see now that i made uh, an error we had uh, natura integration which was uh, funded by the World Bank, which means that the state actually took a loan to fund this uh, project, uh, the mapping of coast uh, non uh, wood habit and inventory of nine taxonomic groups of animals. These were two major pro projects uh, of uh, inventory in the territory of uh, Croatia since we uh, know the research in the Republic of Croatia. We had the project uh, aimed at the drafting uh, of management plans for strictly protected species. I believe that uh, we made uh, management plans for eight species. And what we have now, these are uh, uh, competitive and cohesion projects. Some of them started at 2016, but uh, in some of them we still did not the implementation. We still did not start the field work. One is also related to the monitoring uh, of uh, Nature Natura 2000. And uh, this, we have the project of mapping of coastal and uh, demersal marine habitats. We have a, a problem that uh, we the procurement procedure is a long lasting process. As you can see, in 2016, we should have started with the implementation, but uh, we are still not, we still not been able to go to the field and uh, actually started undertaking activities so the the public procurement is a long-lasting project and uh, this is an advice for you you should focus on this and uh, you should try to uh, arrange it in a better way now i will open a topic uh, which is uh, related to appropriate assessment of the ecological network or, or article six of uh, habitats directive you see parts uh, of uh, this article i will not read them but uh, through the appropriate assessment uh, of the ecological net network every country is required to to make sure that uh, interventions uh, programs or plans do not undermine the integrity of the ecological network that's in brief 
this is uh, one of the uh, certainly most uh, strongest mechanisms for nature conservation anywhere in the world. And from our experience, what I can say, and I have been involved uh, in the implementation since the beginning, as you will see on the next slide, uh, we had the first appropriate assessments in 2009. And in 2009, we had hardly five employed biologists. This is just to illustrate uh, how poor we were, in, we were in human resources. Today, we have over 20 of biologists and uh, together, with the other partner companies, I can say that more than 50 bi biologists were involved in the activities on nature conservation. And very likely by the end of this year, we will uh, have uh, 10 biologists employed in our authorities. This uh, it should be a very strong mechanism which will make all the stakeholders in the economy to get involved in an adequate way. Because as, as Saya mentioned already, the knowledge, the, the knowledge of biologists is crucial in, and it has never been so important. Uh, there are two stages, uh, uh, the screening, appropriate assessment, and overriding public interest with compensatory measures. Uh, what I could say about that uh, is that I know that uh, very often the investors think if appropriate assessment is not positive. So if we identify, identify uh, probability of uh, major impact, then they say, then, but there is a, an overriding public interest. That's a situation you would not like to be in because that complicates things a lot. I could uh, have uh, another presentation only on this point, but uh, just briefly, in 2005, uh, we intensified uh, uh, activities when the law defined the ecological network. In 2007, regulation, uh, we, we had a support point uh, to uh, carry out appropriate assessment at the beginning we called it uh, uh, nature impact assessment. Then we had to I, I define uh, the content of this new document, which we needed to develop. And then we had some activities uh, related to, access, to the accession process and the approximation process in the following years. When we look at the whole procedure. It can be an independent process. I showed here the process. Uh, and you, as you can see, it is open for the public for uh, during screening phase, uh, appropriate assessment uh, stage, and uh, they all involve public hearing. And as you can see, this is the website of the ministry, which shows uh, the whole procedure. This also can be done uh, within the environmental impact assessment or a strategic environment impact assessment. Just uh, briefly, appropriate assessment uh, for interventions regarding ecological assessment, all those who are authorized persons and who are members of the committees, uh, they, uh, they are all not certain what is a significant impact, how it can be defined. And it has been changed uh, also based on decisions of the EU 
uh, judgments of uh, the EU court. This is nothing which is static. Uh, very often, it is uh, necessary to carry out additional research and the research can take uh, up to a year or even more. And this is uh, something uh, that uh, leaders of any interventions or actions must have in mind. There uh, has been a lot of resistance. First of all, there is a financial aspect and then the aspect of time. If you tell someone that they need to wait for a year to carry out the project, it's a major thing. I also mentioned the education of uh, authorized persons who are carrying out these studies and those who prepare the studies, and also the education of members of uh, committees, commissions. Uh, several manuals uh, were pre uh, developed uh, for the appropriate assessment, uh, uh, and we upgraded them in the recent period, updated them, uh, and uh, they contain some additional document uh, elements. Strategic impact environment assessment is a process causing many problems, particularly when it refers to major assessment and it becomes one in some strategies front and programs, it can create a lot of stalemate and prevention in development of strategic environment uh, impact. It is uh, uh, conducted on a local, regional, national levels. It has been problematic. They had doubts whether some plans such as forestry a strategic uh, planning is required or not. It, it was tried to be avoided in some other processes, but ultimately it is difficult uh, that you can avoid some things since European Union is quite strict in certain matters and they dictate what can be done. So in few years, you receive decision that you are to change the law and procedures. One of the problematic areas is that the assessment of documents at higher level it boils down to the lower level however at the higher level does not have sufficient details so that you can uh, problem is to how detail you uh, how many details you include during this assessment but perhaps I would like to note the part related to the training of members of the committee in our strategic planning. We have noticed not only when it comes to major assessment that many problems can arouse where some members of committees do not fully understand the level of where such documents are being prepared and developed. One thing that I perhaps have not mentioned before in my slides is that in other procedures, uh, appropriate assessment for ecological measure, the role uh, of the Institute, which is called the uh, Nature Conservation Institute, that for any major assessment at any level whatsoever, expert opinion should be issued by the Institute for Nature Conservation. So it is very important element and based thereon, members of the committee should provide their view. Uh, briefly about stakeholders, some of them have been noted here where the implementation of Natura 2000 and the implementation of ecological measures makes them to conduct some new procedure, uh, usually through management plans of natural resources, creation waters, forestry, 
uh, electric distribution company and those who have to slightly change some things in their own procedures. It is something which requires a lot of energy, a lot of efforts to be invested, which would then ultimately pay off. One of the problems that we've been facing is in spatial plans. They must be at the cantonal level, go through the strategic environmental impact assessment. And many cantons, many districts uh, avoid their uh, revisions to spatial plans because uh, in some of the uh, uh, things, interventions that they wanted to do through these plans, they will need to give it up. So development of such plans are quite demanding. They can last for many years. And this is something that nobody is eager to do. One, uh, briefly on a more positive note, one of the issues for stakeholders, agriculturists uh, or farmers, can contribute to different uh, issues through their practices, uh, through the rural development plan, measure number 10, where the ways of management of uh, uh, grassland is regulated uh, so that they contribute to nature conservation and uh, protection of biodiversity. And this is mostly related to Natura 2000. One of the things that we've been working on, uh, is currently working on a project involving monitoring over the implementation of this measure. And we collect information and data for Natura 2000 sites related to types of habitats. Currently, we are developing management plans for the ecological network sites. The management itself of these sites, but also including sectoral plans uh, for management of natural resources. A lot of things have been dealt with under those plans for the implementation of management. And this is one of the very important elements. One of the matters that are uh, uh, contributing. It is the rule book on the uh, targets of conservation and measures of the preservation of target uh, types of uh, birds in the ecological network sites, which defines what, si what is the size of population and what measures should be implemented by individual sectors in order to uh, preserve the species or uh, habitat type. The ways of management of ecological network sites, national parks or nature parks is managed by the uh, state uh, owned uh, institutes. And uh, there are 21 cantons and each canton must have their own public institution which will manage the ecological network uh, sites and they also manage the sites uh, excuse me protected areas in terms of the law on nature conservation but they also manage sites of ecological network uh, problem arises when ecological network site is located and distributed in several cantons every uh, uh, state level institution is in, in charge, which is located in that particular uh, site. However, the management plan is unique for the entire ecological network site. So it's a bit complex. And we have not made such management plans yet. In the upcoming year or two, we will be able to tell you how to overcome this issue, this problem. Uh, what's also important to mention, uh, management, forest management plans or forest land management plans uh, are those plans that uh, uh, manage ecological network sites. So these plans are developed by foresters 
and it's a part which has been uh, currently regulated. Every member state has the obligation to perform monitoring and reporting. We have entered this period of reporting between 2013 and 2018. The next one is between 2019 and 2024. What you can see here in species, we have a lot of gray areas which are unknown. This is the part related to the missing data. However, we have a big project uh, which should organize uh, uh, big size monitoring. One of the problem is that we do not have sufficient uh, experts to perform all the activities that are necessary. I'm not sure if I exceeded my time, perhaps I should stop here or if I have some more time to continue. Zrinka, I'm truly sad to stop you here because all the information that you have shared with us are very important, showing how complex process is ahead of us. Of course, our time for break has already ended. If you want to continue and move on, please do and finish your presentation after the break if you want to do so because it is truly important or we can move on with the next presentation later and you can please join us with the discussion we have already received many questions thank you i do apologize for exceeding the time the last slide or the second to last there is no need for me to read it out i have already mentioned and tackled upon all the issues i'd like just to greet everyone thank you one more time i didn't want to interrupt you because your presentation is quite comprehensive, providing us with many important details, important for us as well. Kindly ask you to uh, take a break for 10 minutes and we will come back at 10.52. Please do not switch off uh, from Zoom. Just come back at 10.52 when we shall resume. Thank you.
the webinar and Adam dear said. attendees of this webinar i hope that you have all come back we have finished with our break we even exceeded it a few minutes we devoted it to reading out your questions i'm glad to see your questions we will try to get responses to your questions from our panelists in order to keep up our dynamics i would kindly ask our uh, next panelist to take the floor and of course i will ask zrinka to provide response to questions and thus uh, cover the remaining parts of her presentation that she didn't manage to present today. Uh, uh, now it is our great honor to hear from Mr. Theo van der Sluis coming from Bageningen Environmental Research. He is a landscape ecologist with a PhD on European processes of landscape change. He has worked for over 20 years on development of networks of protected areas in many European countries, including Central and Eastern Europe. He, I'm glad to say that Theo has actively participated in projects of cross-border uh, cooperation on recognizing important sites for ecological measures between Bosnia and Herzegovina, Serbia and Croatia. He is also involved in the work of the European Center on Biological Diversity with a particular focus on landscape connectivity. Theo, please take the floor. Thank you very much. I would also like to thank the organization for inviting me to present to this large number of people. Um, I should add one point. Uh, I'm also project leader for the biogeographical process, which is a contract with the European Commission, whereby we support all the European member states in developing Natura 2000. And as such, we also organize different workshops, network events, and seminars. Like at the moment, we are preparing for the Mediterranean seminar for all Mediterranean countries to discuss the topics related to Natura 2000 and the new biodiversity strategy. So that also connects to all the previous present presentations. We are supporting the member states in, in their process of implementing, which is an ongoing process. Well, um, let me continue, I will briefly uh, present um, why do we need ecological networks or green infrastructure, as it is always also called, um, a bit about national approaches on ecological networks um, and how to develop ecological networks at site or regional level. And in brief, I will say something about funding and where you can find some further information also. Um, well, ecological networks. Um, one moment, let me check that I have the yes. Um, ecological networks uh, are essential because the modern landscape as we know it is totally fragmented. We have the railways, we have built up areas, we have houses. Next slide, please, by the way. Um, we have uh, our industry and, well, as you know, as we all know, our landscape has considered, uh, has changed considerably. Um, well, as a result, um, we, we see that what was in the past, well, natural habitat, living areas for species, it has decreased and decreased, and you have ended up in a situation where there's very little natural habitat left. In fact, it's the situation at the right bottom. So few fragments of, for instance, forests or uh, wetlands or whatever is remaining. Where we have to go now is to a situation where you try to reconnect what is left. And partly you can focus on restoring lost habitats, lost wetlands or grasslands or whatever. Partly it's also a matter of 
connecting those patches to improve biodiversity. And that relates to the concepts that we discuss, the concept of ecological networks. It's a, a concept which has been, well, much used, developed within landscape ecology. And as mentioned, there are several terms for it. You can call it landscape connectivity or uh, spatial cohesion, or well, nowadays they use also the concept of green infrastructure, which is, which is more or less the same, but more multifunctional. Uh, with, with other functions like re recreation or adapted farming. Well, an ecological network consists of habitat patches for a population of species, a particular species that it exchanges individual by dispersal. So you might have a core area and smaller areas around it. And between those areas, there are species moving and that is how the network functions. So besides core areas, the, the good protected areas, there are also corridors. That's an important concept. And the corridors may differ. It is obvious that a corridor for a fish should be a waterway somehow. It should be water connecting uh, areas. However, a corridor for a bird might be different because they can cover some hostile habitat, hostile territory. So in that respect, uh, well, you, you don't need a physical connection directly. You might perhaps need stepping stones between protected areas. Well, also important is that a network is species-based. It is not a matter of, of doing a calculation and cal calculating a fragmentation index and trying to improve that index that is of no use at all. You have to focus it on certain target species. For instance, a lynx or for instance, fish species for which you want to connect protected areas. Um, yes, and uh, well, if we focus on species, next slide, let me see, yes. If we focus on species, we, we asked experts in the European workshop, which species do most need uh, connectivity, green infrastructure, and well, those experts, 50 or so, they mentioned as first, well, aquatic species, fish species, However, they also mentioned mammals as being very important and also insects to a lesser extent, perhaps uh, birds and flowers. Um, well, that is the kind of gut feeling, of course. Um, and um, it depends very much on the mobility of a species and also the type of available habitat, which is present in the landscape and that uh, forms part of the ecological network. Um, well, to some extent, also some habitats, we, we discussed the different habitats in the Habitats Directive. Also habitats do need connectivity. They also need exchange across the landscape, especially in the light of climate change. That is going to be a very important issue in the near future. Um, well, what uh, species do need what connectivity? Um, first of all, there are species that are good dispersers. There are species that are poor dispersers. That, that means they can distribute, uh, they can move easily or not so easily. Um, and they have different strategies for spatial cohesion. Networks are important for poor dispersals that, that need a small network area, but they are very uh, much dependent on very specific habitats, like for instance, particular rare saproxylic beetles. They, they might need a network to survive. On the other hand, there are also species that might be good dispersers, but they need a large territory, like the lynx that I mentioned before. Um, they need a large area as well. And my 
next slide shows then the well principle. You you have a certain graph uh, of of cohesion of the landscape and a certain aim that you would like to achieve for biodiversity. And uh, along that graph, for instance, where those axes cross, you you see here a marmot and here the fragmentation level is okay. Uh, the species, the, the protected areas are well enough connected for this species to be sustainable. So it is on the threshold value or above the threshold value. Um, that means that for all other species that have less demands, like flowers, like small mice. Znači da druge vrste za koje... Uh, the next slide, please. Yes. And one more, yes. One further. Yes. So all species with less demands on the left of the marmot, like some reptiles, like flowers, like mice, they uh, have a situation where they can exchange between those areas. Whereas species with higher demands, like those ones to the right on top, certain species with large territories or uh, links or so, they might uh, need additional measures. For those species, work has to be done to improve connectivity. Well, I show an example in the next slide of infrastructure to uh, improve connectivity because those species that need improved networks, they do need, well, means to, to cross, for instance, the, the highways. This is an example of our first eco duct in the Netherlands, which was built, I think, 25 years ago. Um, but in the meantime, we have, I think, about 35 ecoducts in the Netherlands to uh, improve landscape connectivity for particular species. Um, well, you see some other examples in the next slide. The otter needs very specific measures uh, also along waterways and the roads to, to pass those roads. Amphibians might need different uh, measures. Uh, Culverts for fish might be an opportunity also. Um, and you also see one ecoduct under construction, which I visited with an Israeli visitor three years ago. So that are all examples of uh, how you can restore connections in the landscape. Uh, next slide, yes. Um, I can't see my Zoom. Well, I will just continue. Um, there's some information about funding in the slide. Um, I will show you some examples of projects that were funded by the LIFE program, the EU LIFE program. Um, it funds, for instance, projects to improve the connectivity for large carnivores, to remove barriers for raptors migration, uh, measures to ensure river connectivity, uh, transnational planning of ecological networks and other conservation actions. So that is a way how projects are funded. Um, this program has been scaled up a lot uh, in the coming years uh, that there is a large increase in budget uh, by almost 2 billion euro from the present life pro program. Um, I'm not sure I couldn't find the information so easily whether at the moment there is pre-accession funding for Bosnia-Herzegovina for this purpose. There was in the past, I, I know that. Um, but there is also, of course, the opportunity to coordinate, to cooperate with other member states. And it might well be possible that Bosnia participates in a project on, for instance, brown beer or links that is focusing on collectivity. 
where Bosnia can be one of the partners in a project. Um, well, coming to policy and legislation, uh, for the European member states, Article 10 of the Habitats Directive is very important to uh, implement corridors to improve the ecological networks. Um, ecological networks are also seen as part of the Natura 2000 network. Ecological corridors, sorry. Um, also, the Emerald Network recommends the development of corridors. And um, the new EU biodiversity strategy for 2030 also highlights the importance of a coherent trans-European nature network. It says exactly to set up ecological corridors to prevent genetic isolation, allow for species migration, and maintain and enhance healthy ecosystems. So also the coming years, this is going to be an important focus because in Europe we have, well, in, in the European member states, we have realized that uh, our the, the conservation status of species and habitats is still insufficient. Too many species are in poor conservation status. That is partly due to, well, uh, poor habitat quality, but partly also due to the poor connectivity, the poor, uh, well, landscape cohesion. Um, so, as mentioned, the, the new strategy mentions that a lot of funds will be available, uh, 20 billion a year, for investing in green infrastructure. Well, if we look at ecological networks at a national level, um, Planning landscape connectivity and the ecological network is uh, done in different ways in, in different regions of Europe. Often you see very regional approaches. Uh, you saw that in the past, like 30 years ago, the, the development of the ecological network started in Central Europe and in the Baltic states. They had a leading role in those days. Um, and we see, see nowadays that, that you can define between federal states and uh, non-federal states. The federal states like Germany, Austria, Italy, and Spain, they are very decentralized and different regions have different approaches. But as other countries, it's a coordinated national approach to develop an ecological network. And I just show a few maps the map from the Netherlands. We started with the ecological network in 1991, 1992. And this is the, the map that was developed at the time. Um, also the map from Estonia, the green network. Uh, this map is from 2010. France has made a very elaborated uh, process of develop different networks that were merged into uh, one map for the Tram Verde et Bleu. Uh, Germany has also a quite different network. It has a federal approach, as I mentioned, so it, it differs how dense the network is in some Bundesländer. Sometimes it's very dense, sometimes it's not. And you have many very small fragmented protected areas. Well, I show some examples of uh, ecological, of, of work on ecological networks, and they come from a study I did for the Topic Center Biodiversity in 2019. I show, well, uh, there are examples in the report on different habitats, for instance, for boreal Baltic coastal meadows, for alpine rivers, and for temporary Mediterranean ponds. And these are all habitats from the Habitats Directive, which are uh, considered important, which are in need of um, connectivity. So you can find it in that report, how that approach is. And you can see the cover of that report. Um, this report is going online, or it is already online uh, now. And I will give you uh, 
afterwards some details to um, check for more information on this study. This handbook is available for all member states and all other countries and interested uh, experts to consult. And one of the chapters is indeed dealing with the green infra infrastructure and network coherence. Well, I give an example of temporary Mediterranean ponds. Uh, there's a distribution map with red dots on the right, uh, where you see where the habitat is occurring. Um, several live projects have been uh, executed in the past to uh, construct and rehabit rehabilitate uh, Mediterranean ponds. Uh, also to eradicate exotic species, which is an important uh, problem for this uh, habitat, to remove drainage ditches and for reintroduction of species. And uh, there is, for, there are, for instance, uh, projects on the coast of uh, Portugal, like Charcos, that has been working on it. And in the slide, you also see, by the way, the, the reference to the, the report where this uh, example is worked out. Well, we also did in that same report some examples of species that need connectivity. Uh, one of the species is the European stur sturgeon, or the beluga. It's the large copper, but butterfly species, Eurasian lynx, and the stag beetle. These are also all species from the Habitats Directive. Um, so yeah, check out that report for well more elaboration on this or the handbook where you find the same examples. I also give an example for Ukraine, uh, Belovodsk region, which is Lugansk Oblast, where we nowadays have those uh, problems, all the, the Unrest. Anyway, I, I did some field work there for stepping habitats like 10 years ago. Um, we used a map uh, because, as you recall, uh, ecological networks have to be uh, species specific and habitat specific. So, this purpose was really to make an ecological network for stepping habitats, which are very important in this area. So we prepared that map with remaining grasslands and steppe that are still there. Um, and we defined a number of species which are depending on that steppe habitats. And the species, uh, they, they differ from spotic suslik up to uh, the wolf, steppe harrier, or eagle owl. And the species differ in their requirements. On the left top, there are species that need only small areas. They have limited range. Right bottom, you see species that have a large range and also need very large areas. And in developing a network, you, you should, well, define what your aim is. Are you happy if the marble polecat with all the species to the left can come back? What do you want to have a higher aim and want to have um, well populations of wolves that can move in the landscape? So that, that is a choice for politicians to make, but we as specialists, species experts, we have to advise the policy makers on, on what approach and which species can be focal for a network. Well, um, we visited all the remaining steppe grasslands. We identified what the good grasslands were. And we also identified in the landscape where potential corridors could occur. Uh, and that are the yellow lines in the map. That are the, the possible steppe corridors. Um, we did spatial modeling. Um, I won't go into much detail, but uh, what you see here is a map uh, that we analyzed with the model large. And you see that in the bottom center, there is a dark, well, bright green area, which is considered a poor area for the step marmot. And in the ecological network, you aim to 
make connections from that area to other areas. So with the model, we could show also if the, the network could work, would be sufficient for the species to obtain sustainable populations. So that, that is an approach that we followed there, but we, we did similar work, for instance, in central Poland uh, for the, the Vistula River and in other regions in Europe as well. Um, well, if you recall well, uh, our colleague from Croatia mentioned in her slides also the work that was done on the Sava River. And I happened to, to be in Bosnia in the, the years two, 2003 till 2005. Uh, at that time, I also met already Senka Barudanovic. Um, but at that time, we had a Partners for Water project, which was also working, looking at developing an ecological network for the Sava. And we worked with the different governments, with the different authorities, the River Basin Committee, um, experts in conservation planning on this network. And uh, we worked on the ground. We, we had several experts involved from the different countries. We, we organized at the time also a workshop in Sarajevo where we discussed, uh, well, the network. And of course, in those days, the, the means were not as good as we have them nowadays, but, but we managed to print large maps. And with the experts, uh, in this case, uh, Croatian experts, we looked at the quality of areas and at species which would depend on the Sava River for collectivity. It is very important to stress here that uh, in this work, transboundary work is essential. And that is not only for Bosnia, it, it counts for all European member states. Also, France and Germany have to discuss those transboundary corridors. Networks don't stop at a border. Networks cross those borders. So it, it needs discussions with neighboring countries, with neighboring regions, to um, define what priority should be, which species should have priority, and what joint measures can be made to, to make a joint network. And as mentioned, live projects, for instance, can be such a tool to, to develop or to open such discussions, but also other means can be followed. Um, well, then I come to my final slide uh, with key findings. Um, well, it doesn't matter much what name you give it, whether it is ecological network or network coherence or green infrastructure. The names may differ, but the concepts are similar. It is a matter of connecting areas, connecting natural habitats. Um, the problem is that many networks are developed. They are on paper, but they are not brought into practice. It remains a paper network. So uh, in reality, a lot of work has to be done at a national level to improve the network coherence or the landscape collectivity. You have to make that map also practice. And you have to discuss with the different landowners how to realize a corridor that the landowners will accept, but that also should the purpose of connecting those protected areas. As mentioned, the new biodiversity strategy 2030 is very important for the EU member states to improve the ecological networks. Um, crucial in, uh, aspect is that ecological networks should be species-based. So, do not just connect the protected areas. It doesn't make sense to connect wetlands with forest areas because there is no cor corridor necessary, usually. You connect wetlands with wetlands or forests with forests or grasslands with grasslands. Um, well, there are opportunities for funding, perhaps pre-accession funding or other ways of funding, and that should be looked into. 
uh, one thing that I haven't mentioned in my slide, but uh, in our work uh, for the biogeographical process, uh, we have a newsletter where we announce different meetings, discussion groups. For instance, we, we plan this year uh, a meeting on um, flyways for birds, for ecological networks for birds in, in Croatia, I think. Um, if you subscribe to our newsletter, you will be informed about such events happening and you can join those meetings either online or live in Croatia. Um, so I will put that, uh, the email address in the chat so you can subscribe to the newsletter and be informed about the activities that we are doing on the European Natura 2000 network. That's all I want to say. Thank you very much. Hvala vama, Teo, na ovim informacijama. Zbilja, thank you, Teo, for your information. Uh, we have received many information today. I would like to thank Zrinka, who has been helping us with responses in the um, answers and questions box. I would kindly ask Kaya to take the floor and to present her second presentation. Yeah, uh, thank you. And now we have come to a, a stage where all those ideas and uh, and uh, the, the pre-work and the establishment of the areas has uh, uh, has come to a point to put into into action how to implement that and what mechanisms and what instruments the governments uh, have. Or and I would like to illustrate uh, some of the some of the possibilities. So some people say that uh, there is no question, nature has intrinsic value and, and we should uh, be very careful uh, of uh, destroying it or, or affecting it. Although we all know that we, we are using uh, natural resources uh, uh, and we trade with them and there are resources that we are not trading with. Uh, and uh, but but still we are we are trying to put some some price tags on on the on the, um, the resources. Uh, and I would like to go through uh, what we mean by uh, land management for conservation, and and then uh, a few arguments uh, that are prevailing and and have been. Uh, I would say universal uh, to all the countries, uh, independent on whether they are EU members or not. And uh, to illustrate uh, uh, how the, the nature conservation in, uh, in land management uh, have been implemented and what are the, the new trends and, and uh, ways out uh, on the example of Austria, which is perhaps more uh, I mean, from the natural point of view, the natural environment point of view, more similar to uh, Bosnia uh, than Estonia is, because Estonia is a flat country, uh, similar to uh, the Netherlands. But of course, uh, the density of people is, is quite different. And uh, this uh, uh, makes uh, quite a difference also in the attitudes and and, uh, and nature conservation uh, objectives. Would I have this next slide, please? So when we are talking about the land management for conservation, then, then people usually think that, the, yeah, this is about jobs and this is about jobs. And, uh, and uh, there is a, a quite a widespread uh, hesitation that uh, nature conservation will put restrictions on the economic activities, and uh, there will be a reduction in jobs, especially in the rural areas. Uh, and uh, so there is a, quite a large cost involved uh, that uh, the society uh, should, should bear. I would like to touch upon some of the issues. So in the nature conservation, of course, the primary object, objective is to maintain the favorable conservation status of species and habitats. And this forms the framework of uh, land management as well, as we were talking about earlier 
uh, how to assess the impacts and, and how to avoid them. It's also about uh, soil and water, uh, not, not only about uh, forestry and uh, agriculture, but uh, also forest soil and, and uh, the, the water systems uh, more broadly. Uh, and it's about landscapes, because when you look at a very specific area, very localized uh, concrete area, this might not solve the problem. Uh, you should uh, broaden your view uh, to the catchment area, to the landscape area, to uh, different administrative scales. As we have talked uh, here today, uh, the integrity of the site is very important. And this was uh, the main message by Theo, that how to maintain the connectivity and integrity of the green infrastructure, the green areas. Uh, what is more broadly uh, being discussed in the, across Europe is uh, the nature-based solutions. And it's not so much uh, about perhaps uh, nature conservation, but how to use nature and the functions for the benefit of, let's say, water purification, wastewater treatment, and, so, and also avoid uh, flooding, for instance. And uh, more importantly, uh, also the different research groups and also the governments are looking for how to put a value on ecosystem services, because uh, we are using the, the ecosystem functions, but not, we are not necessarily paying for them and, uh, and, uh, and how to, to uh, put a price tag also on, on them. And probably most recent uh, uh, action and, and also the application of, of uh, sustainable land use uh, is uh, uh, related to result-based payments. Uh, so far, the, the farmers have been uh, able to apply for action-based uh, payments. Let's say they, there are certain criteria how to apply for agri-environmental uh, uh, support when they do uh, good things to the nature. But uh, it is more widely being discussed that we should uh, rather be focusing on the results rather than single actions. The next one, please. So I would like to briefly touch upon the three issues. Uh, it's about um, uh, the restrictions to the economic activity, uh, then the public uh, the cost on the public uh, budget, and, uh, and whether nature conservation can only be implemented on public land. So let's take the first uh, aspect about uh, the restrictions to the economic activity. The next slide, please, and perhaps also already we can go to the to the next one. Uh, so uh, the, yes, uh, uh, there are uh, certain economic restrictions uh, because the primary aim is to conserve the species and habitats. Uh, so not all the economic activities uh, can be implemented or, or not at the amount and scope as they perhaps uh, were envisaged by the developer. But uh, it's, it's not about uh, losing jobs. Uh, the jobs are actually created somewhere else. So they are not created uh, in the industry, but they are created in the forestry, in the agriculture, in the nature tourism. Uh, and, uh, and also those who are not necessarily involved in those sectors, but own the land and they can't use uh, uh, their land as they perhaps uh, would have uh, liked to because of the nature conservation limitations, then the, the countries, the governments uh, are also compensating uh, for those restrictions. The next slide, please. So yes, the, the public budget uh, is important because the nature conservation is, uh, is a public good, uh, is a public activity, and, uh, and uh, it's expected that all the society uh, contributes to that. 
But uh, not all the, the benefits are quantifiable, as I already mentioned, for instance, the ecosystem services, also how to put a price tag to the clean air or, or, or clean water uh, that we enjoy either out, uh, outside or, or inside uh, environments, uh, and, and also nature as a, as a cultural good uh, source for culture and also people's behavior. The next one, please. As to the public land, uh, uh, yes, uh, again, uh, this is partly true uh, because uh, all the governments across Europe have found that uh, implementing uh, the nature conservation objectives are more uh, easier, uh, more straightforward uh, on public land uh, than, uh, than on private land, because uh, the private landowners may have different uh, objectives of uh, using the land. But when we look at the numbers, for instance, even in Estonia, then the protected areas are uh, divided between different uh, management zones and uh, and there is a management zone where there is uh, the share of uh, private and, and public uh, land is 50-50, but all together, together with the very restricted uh, protected areas, it counts for 20% uh, on, on private land. Uh, when we take the examples, the next slide, please, of Austria and Estonia, and I'm just uh, not to go into the, the, the Austrian slides in detail, but this is just for, for you for further exploration. Next slide, please. Uh, just to show you that uh, how uh, Austria has tackled uh, the, the, the farmland management and the forest management in, in their country. And as you see from, uh, from those uh, boxes, there is there is quite a number of Kaya Snima's pre Snima's some in a second. Kaya, if I may interrupt you only for yeah. one brief moment. Thank yeah. you. If I can kindly ask you, it is impossible to complete this yeah. big yeah. issue today. If we skip the, the no. Austrian examples, yeah. So just I kindly ask you to go back to Estonian example and then to have uh, some time uh, left for us for discussion. Thank yeah. you. Uh, so just uh, just to conclude, uh, the Austrian case, you can study that how the Austrian government is also paying supplementary or as they call premiums uh, when the farmers are doing or taking uh, agri-environmental measures that are good for the nature. The next one. And also you can go further than that. This, this is the, just a calculation of how the premiums are, are calculated. The next one, please. And also the next one. <laughs> Uh, and the next, and uh, yeah, the next, please. Uh, just to just to show that uh, yes, the, the state and the, the private land share in Estonia is uh, is eighty two to twenty in a, in a broader sense, and also the government is uh, is has a long term plan how to how to buy uh, from private ownership to the state ownership of the of the nature conservation land that have uh, really uh, very restrictive uh, management, um, uh, very restrictive on management. The next one, please. Um, but what I want to emphasize here is that with this slide is that uh, the governments or so the countries are not alone. When you look at the right-hand side graph, it shows that actually eight, more than 80% of the funding to compensate for the restrictions comes from the EU and uh, national government puts even less than 20%. Uh, and uh, so there is a possibility, there are options how to manage uh, the nature conservation areas with the EU funds and, uh, and from, from different pro programs. 
especially uh, with the CAP or the Common Agriculture Policy, the Rural Development Plan measures, uh, which shows uh, the, the left graph. I think this is, that's it. Yeah, and some illustrations from, from Estonia. And the next one, please. Uh, how, what are the, the euros per hectare paid in Estonia for managing uh, different uh, habitat uh, types? This is on annual basis. Uh, and uh, and uh, these are quite uh, motivating for the farmers uh, and, uh, and for the landowners. So please uh, study those slides. There is uh, also compensation system for damages uh, occurred by the protected species. And, uh, and uh, so these systems uh, are all in place uh, and, uh, and very helpful to, to uh, also to alleviate uh, the, the restrictives uh, uh, from uh, nature conservation. Thank you. Thank you, Kaya, for your presentation. And I, again, apologize for asking you to skip a part of your presentation, which would also be beneficial and resourceful. But as I have said already, it is obvious that we cannot manage to do everything that we have planned on the agenda because we see that an interest by participants is great. Many questions have been asked. I've already uh, thanked Zrink and thank you for writing uh, your responses to questions. But I believe that there are other questions that should, that deserve answers and it would be beneficial for all participants. I've tried as we went along to compile some of the questions. I apologize to those participants whose, mention, whose names I would not mention. I will start with Zrinka again. And some questions were asked of her about the uh, usability of our current plan for Natura 2000, you've seen from the presentation that Bosnia and Herzegovina has a plan for two ta Natura 2000, identified based on uh, reference literature. And the question for Ovalas, what's next? How to proceed? Thereafter, I can ask the next question. Uh, please be brief in your responses. We don't have much time. Another question for you, Zrinka for you, please take the floor. Many of participants asked uh, with respect to the integral process in establishing Natura 2000, the question of conflict of interest between local communities and the interest for establishing a protection of biodiversity through establishment of ecological networks the questions of the strategic assessments, what is a quantity, how to plan it in the next 10 years, strategic assessments, and with respect to appropriate assessment and so on. Can you please elaborate and give specific responses to our participants? I'll start from the last one. I forgot what was the first question already, but the last question you asked. It is a process which requires time, and we are still in the process for spatial plans. Our spatial plans are not aligned with requirements uh, for the Natura 2000 implementation. In many parts thereof, when we authorize persons work on appropriate assessment on the project and the ecological measures. Uh, we have a problem where a, a plan has envisaged something, but uh, can, will not be uh, implemented with significant impact. Then a problem uh, arises, overriding public interest, compensation measures, and so on and so forth. So it is a process that is quite lengthy and much longer, and the implementation of such project is much more demanding in terms of its finances. Alignment at all levels in terms of different sectors and all other documents 
is long lasting, time consuming. So nothing can do about it. Uh, we have joined European Union. You cannot have it all at one uh, 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 simultaneously. Uh, you are given a time period where uh, some things are supposed to be aligned and fully implemented. Nat Natura 2000 ecological measures are not in possession of some member states that have been members for many years and they do not have it fully implemented to be called perfect. There are still some parts lacking some elements where you need to supplement and add other issues. I hope that I answered this part with respect to proposal of Natura 2000 in Bosnia and Herzegovina. Uh, some proposals have been made uh, in Croatia as well in 2007. In the meanwhile, um, uh, some things have changed in their definitions. By 2013, a bulk of information have been collected uh, based on which some things have been revised. Some species were no longer the objective of preservation. Perhaps some others uh, have become. So it's a process. Today, it can happen where ecological network site, Croatia realizes that in data deficiency species do not include a data sufficient data so we realize that this species is no longer there so it is a more complex issue can you then uh, uh, move such species from ecological network or not you are to prove whether you did everything you could for its conservation why is no longer there so the only thing that I can say, collect data, try to collect and to designate based on the known data. However, if data is not verified for the precaution reason, you certain things should be included in the ecological network site until you prove they no longer exist and that there are no requirements. These are detailed uh, answers uh, to the questions that came. You said at the beginning uh, there was a strong development of legislation as a pre-requirement for activities uh, in the development of ecological network. Could you give us uh, an advice to this end? Like with any piece of legislation, you can easily adopt legislation and declare ecological network but at a certain point we started to apply it in 2009 practically we started uh, with first uh, appropriate assessments for ecological network and that's where we started to apply the ecological network and the first uh, assessment that was done within the uh, environmental impact assessment went well there were no uh, major conservation measures required. But the first individual independent was about the intervention at the rivers Una, Mura and Drava, and the process has not ended yet. The ministry in a way concluded that this uh, should uh, be uh, discussed in terms of overriding uh, national interest and that was impossible for such intervention and actually such approach sent a message the owner of the intervention was the company creation waters and they are a state within the state they're very strong whatever they intend they can implement and at that time they thought no one can interfere with their interventions and uh, what happened 
was that the appropriate assessment actually stopped their intervention and that everyone realized, well, this is something we will have to take into consideration. Maybe brief, one brief question. Who is funding the appropriate assessment in Croatia? The investors do, the investors. It is much clearer now. Thank you very much for both uh, your participation in this webinar and your assistance and uh, your answers. Uh, we've seen that there is a lot of interest uh, in your answers. Uh, now, may I ask Kaya to provide some answers uh, to questions asked from her. First of all, I've seen among the questions sent by our participants, uh, the point that there is a need to better understand uh, the relation between protected areas and uh, nature, uh, ecological network sites. And also, there are areas uh, which require funding uh, uh, from the companies which manage the ecological network. And also, if you could come back to the end of your presentation, the benefits for the population from the establishment of ecological network. Our goal is to obtain as much information as possible about the benefits, not only for biodiversity, but potential economic ben benefits for the population which live in the territories covered by ecological networks and neighboring areas. Kaya, please. Yeah, thank you. Uh, probably it relates also to the, to the previous question uh, that, uh, uh, and this especially with the timing, uh, the timing is very important because uh, when, uh, let's say, um, Bosnia and Herzegovina has submitted a list of potential SCIs or or SPAs to the European Commission. And now let's say the forest has been felled, uh, the waterways have been changed. Uh, so there are major changes uh, in, the, in the natural environment that the species might not be there, the habitat uh, is, is not there anymore. So th this is, this is a, 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 an issue between the Commission and the country, uh, whether this uh, area can be restored uh, or it should be excluded from the from the Natura 2000 network list. So this is just a comment, my comment to the previous question. But as to the protected areas and the, the ecological network, uh, for instance, in Estonia, we have 23% of the territory protected and Natura sites are a little bit less than 18%. So there is 5% of land which is which is not in the natura network uh, in the in this uh, as you call it the ecological network because uh, every country has uh, has history of uh, protected areas mm -hmm. and, uh, there was no need to yeah. include them and then to do it purely as as natura network but uh, this is our our heritage this is our natural heritage and and this uh, needs to be protected as well. However, as I explained, there are certain and very different rules for Natura network and for the national uh, network of protected areas. And, uh, and this, this should, be, uh, um, should be taken into, into consideration. Uh, as to the benefits, uh, the, the last uh, question, and, and yeah, for, for the people. So as I said, uh, actually, uh, when you put everything on the table or even in the same Excel table, you may find that, that uh, the, the, the benefits overweigh the, the restrictions. Uh, because uh, as, I, as I explained, that there are lots of different uh, uh, possibilities uh, when you become EU country. Uh, to apply for funds, uh, to apply uh, different measures uh, on top of the national budget. And, and as I showed, even the 80% comes from the EU and, and not necessarily uh, for, uh, for, uh, for the uh, nature conservation, but through the, the 
the farming and agriculture and rural development, which, which is the biggest budget in the EU, comprising about 40% of the EU total budget. So uh, I would also um, recommend to uh, when, when to develop those measures and to see how it matches uh, with the rural development uh, measures, especially the, the green measures, the agri-environment measures. Thank you very much. I think these arguments uh, can serve a lot uh, to the benefit uh, of, devel uh, of development of ecological network. In our discussions with local communities, when we were, tr uh, when we, if we are able to explain the compensatory measures and other facilities, we will be in a better position. And finally, at the end, uh, I will have one or more questions for Theo, which relates to the need uh, for connectivity for the purpose of flow of genetic material and uh, the establishment of networks should uh, be based on ecological knowledge. I would uh, like to highlight a specific uh, point in our country, uh, which is regulated by the law on protection, uh, nature conservation in Bosnia and Herzegovina. I guess the approximation process uh, uh, will be in form of a special ecological individual uh, ecological networks, which will be connected into single BIH ecological uh, network. And uh, the issue of connection of these small parts of ecological networks in Bosnia and Herzegovina is very important. Uh, can you uh, give us an advice how we can work on development of a single network uh, which con uh, comprises uh, 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 some individual parts. Theo, Theo, please, Theo. Yes. Um, well, it's a, a bit of general question. Um, first of all, it's very important to, to have a, a basis with, with good maps. As we saw from Croatia, they, they had a very good database established with uh, vegetation sites, the, the protected areas. So that is an important basis. And uh, a second step is to, to define which species are really targeted or which ecosystems are targeted for an ecological network. And um, in the case of Bosnia, I, I can indeed think of, of the forests as, as important habitats as well, the semi-alpine areas, they, they are quite important as well. They are very particular for the flora and very rich as well. Um, and I guess also the, the wetlands and aquatic habitats are an important ecosystem that, that are the first ecosystems that come to my mind as, as focal. And based on that, you should identify which species are protected within those habitats that can form a kind of, of leading species to, to develop the network for. Like in the Netherlands, we, we had, uh, I, I showed examples of the ecoducts, and those were very much developed for the roe deer, which was the largest mammal in the area. So you look at where are the roe deers now? Where are good uh, adjoining areas that, that should be or can be linked by, by solving the, the bottlenecks with the highways. And based on that, we made uh, the, we identified locations for the ecoducts. So yeah, that, that would be my approach. First of all, make sure you have your data in order, collect it and, and store it and make it available digitally like in Croatia was done. And well, I'm sure you're also on your way of, of developing such databases. Second, identify most important ecosystems which are relevant for, for your country. Uh, well, the, the different units in fact as well, because it's quite complex in Bosnia. 
And thirdly, identify your focal species where you will work for and be sure that, that for instance, if you establish a network for the brown bear, many smaller species which have the same habitat use as a brown bear will benefit from the same network. So it's not one species that you work for, but a larger group of species, a trait that, that uh, is kept covered then. And the species itself, if you make sure that it is a, a, an appealing species like a fish otter in many countries, people like the fish otter. If that is a leading species, then you will also work on the acceptance by, by stakeholders, by, well, the policymakers, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much for this answer. Zinka, would you like to add something? No, no, I, I did not understand that the question was asked from Pia. I see that we have some other questions, but at this point, we don't have more time to look at them and to address them. But I do promise that Professor Mataruga and myself, we will look at them. We will try to answer the question or link these who are uh, persons who ask these questions with our experts. And as we are coming to the end of our webinar, I would uh, try to briefly round up what we've heard from the presentations and the discussion. Going back to the beginning uh, and the points made by Kaya in the first uh, presentation, the legislation is a, a crucial requirement for any further action. What we have also learned uh, is that the integrated approach and cooperation with other sectors horizontally and vertically is uh, also a crucial precondition for development of further actions. We also heard from all our panelists that the ecological knowledge are the basis and the use of this ecological knowledge in the development of these network are indeed the base basis. And uh, what we heard today about the appropriate assessment, the need to develop cap uh, strength and capacities, and the question from our audience about the relation between the management plans and the establishment of development of uh, ecological networks tell me something and that that today's uh, webinar is just a beginning of activities in this highly complex process and i think that uh, it uh, this webinar came at a good time we are developing the environmental strategy, which comprises uh, a biodiversity chapter for the next 10 years. We should use and grab every po po possibility and chance to meet as much as possible to develop our knowledge and skills for the process we all need to contribute to. and that's uh, then we will ha be in a position to show something to the decision makers we have uh, different stakeholders from the non-governmental sectors governmental sectors students and uh, we should focus on prioritizing actions that need to be taken of course uh, we will seek uh, to uh, pursue uh, establishment of uh, ecological networks, uh, that's our goal. At the end, I would kindly ask Mr. Mataruga to address you, to share with us uh, his conclusions. Professor Mataruga, back to you. <clears throat> Thank you, Professor. Uh, uh, last uh, weekend was very nice so i went I, I spent it outdoors and uh, caught cold i will not take uh, too much time i have uh, 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 
try to sustain to ask questions and participate in the discussion i wanted to allow more space to our panelists and to the uh, audience of uh, this webinar i absolutely agree with the conclusions uh, of professor barudanovic and uh, again i also believe that this is a very good time very good point to address uh, what uh, we already decided will be the part of our environmental strategy. We should seek, and I hope that uh, the technical support uh, will help us in doing this. Uh, uh, we will try to uh, communicate your questions to the panelists and to answer those we can answer. Just please provide your email addresses. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Mataruga. I uh, will use this opportunity to thank the SEI organizer of this event. And uh, at this point, uh, I will ask them to organize the next event because it uh, is entirely clear that we just tackled this topic and that we need much more knowledge to define clearly our policy areas, our course of action, uh, which will serve the conservation of nature to the benefit of the citizens of Bosnia and Herzegovina. Thank you all. Thank, uh, thank our panelists, uh, the participants, and take care. Stay safe. Thank you.